Okay, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to go over today is, is pretty much just an overview of the research that's been going on for about the past year and a half uh, at Texas Agri Life. It'll go over the previous stuff we've done and some of the new stuff uh, that we're currently doing. So just a brief overview, you know, why look at alternative uh, uh, fuel and food sources, uh, whether you believe in, uh, uh, you know, uh, peak oil, uh, it's undeniable that the world's crude oil reserves are declining, uh, forcing the use of alternative fuel sources. Uh, there was a really good paper by uh, Godfrey et al., and they're also looking at uh, protein limitations, uh, protein, uh, alternative protein sources. Uh, pretty much uh, world's population continues to increase, uh, but the amount of arable land and production from the seas remains stable where it decreases. So people are constantly looking for uh, alternative protein sources uh, for feed uh, and fuel. In terms of why microalgae, uh, we've all seen this before. Uh, they have growth rates which are much higher than current biofuel feedstocks. A uh, big benefit is they can be produced using uh, wastewater uh, and also on lands not suitable for agricultural purposes. So you can have low saline groundwater or maybe areas that don't have enough rain uh, you can use uh, to grow microalgae. A big benefit of microalgae is it does not compete with uh, food crops for potable water supplies uh, like corn currently does. Uh, and why corn is uh, uh, typically, uh, people don't want to use corn or feedstocks for a fuel source. Uh, and then most importantly, another good paper uh, by Wang et al., uh, they looked at what can you do with the, the biomass. Uh, you can use it intact or after lipid extraction. Uh, you can do renewable fuels. Uh, you can do livestock aquaculture feeds. Do organic fertilizer as, as Jamie does or they even just uh, simply dry it and burn it as a cogeneration. So this is just an overview of the facility. Uh, we have the 12 outdoor raceways. Uh, each of them are equipped with a, a pH control system, which uh, adds CO2 to the solenoid to maintain a, a pH of approximately uh, 7.8 in the raceways. Uh, and when we add it, the algae, we typically start at about 5 centimeters and gradually run it up to the 20 centimeters, which gives you the 550 liters. Uh, we also have the indoor production room. Uh, we keep our uh, little cultures in the 125 ml Erlenmeyer's, and then when we bring them up for an experiment, we'll move them to the 2.8 liter firm back flask. Then they go into a five gallon carboy, and from there we'll put them into the sun tubes uh, and the production tanks on the, the floor. We've added recently uh, a diurnal incubator, and we set up the incubator with a CO2 system and an air system, uh, so we're able to dose uh, CO2 and air into there. We've also adapted it so that we get uh, lighting levels from anywhere from about 300 lux to about uh, 12,000 lux. So we're able to also look at uh, differences in light. We've also had a little, uh, it's not a, a technical uh, clean room, but we've put the area where we have our cultures in the back and we have a plastic screen on it. We're able to keep it uh, much cleaner. Uh, what we're starting to do, and we'll go over one study that we've done recently, but we're, what we're trying to start to do with this incubator <laughs> as time permits, is to screen uh, local samples at higher temperatures to try to figure out what algae species uh, are out there that do well at high temperature. And as we get them, uh, we clean them up and we put them into the little flasks. And then eventually, as, as time permits, we move them outside for trials or also do uh, uh, small trials in the incubator. So why look at local species? There's over 50,000 uh, species that have been uh, identified during every ecosystem. Uh, basically, there's too many to the screen. You're not going to be able to screen all, all 50,000. Uh, but what makes microalgae nice is because they are in every ecosystem, uh, they're able to adapt to 
uh, specific local environments or specific local growing conditions. So uh, one way to do it uh, is a potential solution is just to screen the local species already adapted to the local uh, growing conditions. And there are some studies out there that have shown that if you use a local adapted species, uh, you get higher biomass production than a non-native or non-adapted uh, species. And again, there's really not enough time to screen all 50,000. You have to start somewhere. Uh, so why not start uh, with your local species? Uh, what we've been doing uh, heavily the past few months uh, when we had the time is basically going out and collecting water samples. Uh, we'll look at, we'll add nutrients to it. We'll select uh, those that have the, the most dominant species or the most dominant two species. Uh, try to get into pure culture and then uh, we'll screen those either in the incubator or uh, outdoors at a higher temperature. So some of the work we've done, and again this work spans about the, the past year and a half, uh, one of the studies that initially got us into this uh, was a, a local Phaeodactylum, uh, which was uh, uh, Marcy Derusher, which who worked in the lab. Uh, she got a water sample. Uh, the graduate student, Zach, uh, was able to isolate it. Uh, and we looked at it in our outdoor raceways under monoculture. For stocking, basically, we will stock uh, the Nanoclapsus salina, uh, the failed aculum, uh, which we got from uh, CCMP, which one that we purchased, and also the failed aculum local species. Uh, we typically try to start at about a starting density of about 0.2 grams per liter of ash tree dry weight at five centimeters. And again, we'll gradually bring that up to the, the final 20 centimeters. Uh, duration of the study, we normally terminate the studies four days after we hit nitrogen limiting conditions. Uh, in terms of experimental design, uh, water depth in each raceway is gradually increased to 20 centimeters, and it gives you a 550 liter uh, working volume. The nutrient mix uh, was identified by Odi Zamora. It's ammonium sulfate, phosphoric acid, uh, and ferrous sulfate. And then the raceways are monitored uh, for solar radiation, rainfall, wind speed, pH, temperature, salinity, uh, daily ash free dry weight, daily ammonia, nitrite, uh, nitrate, and phosphorus. This is one of the first studies we did with the local species and, and what got us really interested is you'll see that the local FAO uh, significantly outperformed uh, the FAO that we had purchased, and they both significantly outperformed uh, the nano. What you need to keep in uh, mind when you look at this study, uh, this was done during the cooler weather, cooler season, and FAO dactylin typically does better at the cooler weather. If we were to run this in the high heat of summer, uh, FAO dactylin wouldn't uh, outdo uh, Selena. But under these growing conditions, uh, the local species uh, performed better than uh, the one that we purchased, and they both performed better than uh, the nano. And again, we do nitrogen limitations, so four days after, uh, we'll terminate the study. This just gives you the final production values. So the end Selena was 0.53 final. Uh, ash for dry weight per grams per liter, and then we had our purchased Phaeodactylum of 0.64, and the local one, again, uh, was significantly uh, higher final concentration than both uh, the one we purchased and the Ensolina, which is just the uh, 1776 strain. Uh, not all the time you get a local species that does better than a uh, uh, one that you purchase. Uh, these two species, DOE, DOE 0890 and DOE 916, were uh, identified by Jorgen Polly out in Brooklyn College. Uh, he isolated them for us. We put them into the raceways. Uh, and in this case, uh, you have no significant difference at the end. So we had three different species of, of, of nanocolapsis, and you don't have a, a one that performed better than the other. So not every a local species is going to outperform uh, non-local species. And again, this is just uh, the final production numbers uh, of the Selena, DOE, 
and 916, you can see there's no significant difference uh, in final production uh, for all three of them. One of the ones that we've done recently is with an amphora species uh, that we've been working with. Uh, we've worked with amphora species in the past. Uh, typically, the growth was quite low, and the cultures tended to uh, form films on the paddles and the sides. This species, uh, we're not sure what type of amphora it is, but this one uh, has not formed the, the clumps or the mats. Uh, so what we did was we looked at the culture, uh, uh, Selena, amphora, and a mixture of them. Again, we started at about 0.2 to 0.23 grams per liter of tree dry weight. Again, the studies terminated four days after uh, you hit nitrogen limited conditions. Uh, again, water depth starts at 5 centimeters and gradually, gradually brought up to 20. Uh, uses the same nutrient mix and we look at the same uh, parameters. What's interesting about this is the first thing that probably jumps out is uh, you don't have tremendous growth in all three of them. But what is interesting about this study is in on a few of the days, the afternoon high temperature in the raceways hit 35 to 36 degrees Celsius. So the growing conditions for just about every type of algae uh, was really poor. The Selena uh, started at 0.2, only got to about 0.3, uh, not much growth. Uh, even with the mixed culture uh, and the straight and four, the growth wasn't uh, tremendous. But what's interesting about this is uh, what you see here is the hotter it got, uh, nano didn't do good, but the amphora did good under, uh, relatively good under these uh, culture conditions. Uh, and then at the end where you start seeing the Selena coming up uh, and the mix and the amphora coming down, it started to cool off. So the nano was in there. Uh, it wasn't doing well, but it was still viable in the raceway. And what, and this just goes to show you the Selena, again, growth went from 0.23 to 0.3, very low growth. And even in the, the amphora and mix, again, we don't have uh, had a tremendous amount of growth, but you're still getting some type of production even at extremely high temperatures. But what really makes this study interesting, or I thought made it interesting, is when we brought the culture in, it was on the left. Uh, you look at it, it's fairly an amphora-dominated uh, culture. Uh, we brought it into the room. The room is air conditioned to 70. The temperature in the, the sun tubes is typically about 22 to 23 Celsius. And then you can see it went green after two weeks. So the nano was still viable in there and it came back after uh, even being outdoors under the 35, 36 degrees. So the big question is, you see this in a small tube, you know, the goal of the whole mixed culture and what we're trying to do is, can you put these mixes of species in a, a large raceway and let it go uh, for a year or so and just harvest and have them come up and down over time? Even though the nano, again, when we brought it in, there were a few nano cells and it was heavily in four dominated, just changing the temperature and uh, changing the temperature and obviously the light conditions because it's indoors, but the Selena was still viable in there and still came up to dominate the population as compared to uh, when we brought it in. So it would be nice to know if you had a raceway that you can keep it going long term, can you uh, see these changes over time uh, in a single raceway. Why mixed species? Uh, there's a study that was uh, published in 2008 uh, where they looked at mixed microbial cultures uh, and the ecologists concluded that there is an increase in ecosystem productivity uh, as species diversity increased. And they go on to uh, give their hypothesis of why they believe that. But uh, in 2010, Smith et al. Uh, hypothesized that lipid production in microalgae cultures uh, could be increased if you use naturally occurring multi-species in open ponds instead of a single species community in a closed photobioreactor. So based on this information, a study was done by Stock and Reader et al. in 2012, uh, and they actually had increased lipid productivity from mixed microalgae cultures 
uh, under nutrient limited lab conditions. And they did it, uh, it was a small scale experiment done in uh, uh, 500 mils or less. Uh, what's also nice about this approach, and it's something uh, we want to look at uh, coming up, is it has the potential to simultaneously produce cultures with a, a more optimal amino acid or fatty acid level of profile that hopefully then you can put into an aquatic or a terrestrial diet. Uh, then the individual monoculture counterpart, and again, in a single production raceway, uh, which should increase the value of the biomass uh, for the producer. So we did one large mixed culture experiment, which spanned uh, four seasons. Uh, again, the stocking is the same. We have the Nanoclopsis salina, uh, Theobacillum, our local species, and a mixture of the cultures. Again, we aim for a starting ash-free dry weight of about 0.23 grams a liter. Uh, we terminate four days after nitrogen limited conditions. Uh, we start at uh, five centimeters, work our way up to 20, 550 liters approximately at the end, and the same nutrient mix and the same parameter monitoring. Uh, this is the one that was done in February of 2012. Uh, again, we're nitrogen limited after day 12, and you can see in this case the mixed culture did significantly better than uh, the monoculture of Phytobacterium and uh, the monoculture of, of Salina. And again, we typically see that the Phytobacterium outperforms uh, the Salina, at least under uh, cooler conditions. Uh, what we also look at is the relative abundance ratio. So at the start of this culture, uh, we started out with uh, approximately four to one uh, Salina to Fayo uh, cells. And then you can see as the experiment progressed, uh, we got to about one to one. So it shows that the, the Fayo backbone is, out, uh, is becoming more abundant compared to the Salina uh, in this experiment. Uh, this just gives you the final production numbers. Uh, again, the mix was significantly better than the, the mono of the Feo and the mono of uh, the Salina. And this is our uh, mean lipid content. And what's interesting to point out, uh, in this case, again, we have our four days of nitrogen depletion, and we really don't see a bump in lipid content uh, during certain seasons, whether that's the light, whether it's the temperature, uh, you know, there's different papers out there that suggest either or, but again, our lipid content is fairly stable uh, with or without uh, any type of nutrient uh, deprivation. This was the May of 2012 study. What's interesting about this study to point out is a lot of people will say, uh, the best way to grow algae is to have uh, different strains for different seasons. And you don't have to do a mixed culture, just put the strain out that you think is going to do the best during that season and have different uh, strains. What happened here was in May of 2012, May is still a season typically that would favor uh, failed acolyn growth, probably over salina growth. So if you were to do that, you probably would have just put out a pure culture, monoculture, of the failed acolyn. Uh, we got a five centimeters of rain within about 12 hour period. Uh, and where that affected all the cultures, it affected the failed acolyn much more than the nano. So the nano in this case uh, was able to come back after the large salinity drop. Uh, the mixed culture, which was nano dominated, came back and the failed acolyn pretty much underperformed because the uh, salinity change was just too great for it. It's, it's not as adaptable to the salinity. So in this case, if you put the species out that you thought would do better, uh, you probably would have lower productivity just because of an unexpected event. And you can never uh, plan on when you're going to have a large rain event or a, a shift in temperature. <laughs> this again gives you the idea of the uh, relative ratio. Started again about four to one, but in this case, uh, the Salina, it's definitely a Salina dominated mixed culture, uh, went up to 13 to 1. So the, the, the failed acolyn was still in there, but it was definitely a more 
uh, nano-based mixed culture. And again, this is the final weight, the Selena uh, pure culture and the mixed Selena culture, which was heavily dominated by Selena, uh, were statistically the same, and they both did better than uh, the failed acolyte. Uh, in this case, uh, again, the lipid content uh, was not affected by uh, a four-day uh, nutrient deprivation. You know, from that, it actually went down in the saline after four days. <coughs> this study was done in August, again, under the same uh, methodology. Again, we're nitrogen limited after day seven. Uh, in this case, uh, the mixed culture and the Selena uh, significantly outperformed uh, the monoculture of phaeodactylum, which would be expect. Uh, the temperature is just too hot for the phaeodactylum during August. Uh, this gives you an idea of just how uh, Selena dominated it is. Again, it started about 4 to 1, and you get up to about 620 to 1. Uh, the, the big key or something like this is, and we haven't been able to take it all the way through, but would this raceway eventually be able to come back when it cooled off to a, a failed dactyl and dominate it? Uh, as we saw when we moved the Infor and could we see the same thing but under outdoor conditions? Because it's still in there. Uh, the question is, you know, is it viable enough to come back as the season cools off? Uh, this is the overview. Uh, again, the Selena and the Mixed uh, were the same. Uh, and the failed acolyte uh, performed uh, significantly worse than uh, both the Selena and the mixed. In this case, uh, whether it's, again, the higher light, higher temperature when we do the nitrogen limitation, uh, we're able to take them from about uh, 20, in that case 13, and after four days of uh, nitrogen limitation, uh, you get up to almost 40 to 35%. Whereas we do the exact same four-day nitrogen limitation uh, during the other two trials, and we see absolutely no increase uh, in lipid content. Uh, and there's, again, some people out there say it's a combination of a secondary stress uh, in terms of we have a nutrient stress, but we also have a, a temperature stress. It could also be that there's just higher uh, light levels. But the lipid content does respond to a, a four-day nitrogen uh, limitation. This was the final study in this, November of 2012. Again, we do uh, terminate four days after nitrogen limitation. And in this case, uh, again, it's a cooler season. Uh, the failed aquam uh, does better than the uh, uh, Selena. And again, you can see ratio-wise, uh, it's fairly constant. Two and a half ends at about two to one, so it's slightly more. Uh, failed acolyte. The final weights, the mix significantly did better than the failed acolyte, and the failed acolyte significantly did better than the uh, nano Selena. And again, in this case, uh, we really don't see uh, that as stark of a, a bump up, but there was an increase uh, uh, from your four day uh, nitrogen limitation. So, uh, mid-20s to, to mid-30 percent with a, a four-day nitrogen uh, deprivation. So in two seasons, we saw a bump, the most pronounced being the August. Uh, in the other two seasons, the four-day nitrogen limitation really didn't help at all in terms of a lipid increase. The last one was the, I think it was 2.1 to 1. Can, can you repeat the question? We couldn't hear it over here. Oh, uh, Dr. Fernandez asked uh, what the uh, relative ratio was uh, in the last experiment. Uh, in terms of conclusions, again, the mixed culture raceways during the fall and winter produced significantly more biomass than the monocultures. Uh, Mixed culture race race during the spring and summer uh, produced significantly more biomass than the uh, pedaculum, but were not significantly different than the Selena. 
Uh, the significant increase in productivity in mixed culture raceways suggests uh, the mixed cultures are better able to grow under ambient outdoor conditions uh, when they are most limiting in the fall and winter. But I mean, that's something that we still have to look into why. And again, it'd be nice to know why we're not seeing the, the jump in lipid content uh, every season with a nitrogen limitation. Uh, so do you just mix all your cultures together? No, we've also done work where not all mixed cultures perform better than their respective monocultures. In this case, we have another species uh, from Dr. Uh, Jorgen Pauly from Brooklyn College, the DOE 916, uh, put it in with a mixed culture uh, with the mountain crops of Selena. Uh, and the pure culture of Selena, the uh, 1776, significantly did better than both the uh, uh, mono and mixed culture with the DOE 916. So there are species that you can mix together that will actually uh, seem to compete with each other. So you're not going to always get uh, the significant increase with a, a mixed culture. This was just the final production. Again, the Selena significantly outperformed uh, the 916 and the, the mixed culture. Why optimize nutrients? Uh, this is where the research is, is starting to head now in terms of nutrient optimization, in terms of MP ratio and nutrient reuse uh, with recycled nutrients such as with struvite. Uh, basically, the recent studies suggest that uh, nitrogen phosphorus supplies are insufficient to support even 10% of the domestic fuel supply from algae. Uh, whereas ammonia is a, a renewable resource, phosphate is a non-renewable resource. Uh, and most people say a peak can come as early as uh, 2030. Uh, so basically without technological progress to recycle nutrients, uh, it's basically going to come down to do you put nutrients in to grow algae for food and fuel, or do you use uh, nutrients to grow terrestrial crops? Uh, and the goal is really not to get to the point of one versus the other like it currently is with the uh, uh, corn production for ethanol. One way to do it, and a lot of the work we've been doing uh, small scale is uh, MP ratio, trying to optimize MP ratios uh, so that none of the nutrients are wasted, everything goes to, to growth. Optimization is also important uh, to maximize lipid production. Uh, as Again, lipid content typically accumulates under nutrient limiting conditions, which we saw with the two studies, not all, all every season. And again, if you understand the interrelationship between the MP ratio and biomass, uh, it's important for economic and life cycle analysis. Uh, our early work in this is an uh, outdoor study. We've done some indoor studies. Uh, was just looking at the MP ratio. We looked at a 2.25 to 1. 9.15 to 1 and a, a 16 to 1. And in this case, uh, there was no significant difference. I mean, you can see everything pretty much mirrored itself. Uh, ratio didn't have an effect. Unfortunately, with this study, uh, we didn't get to uh, send the biomass off for lipid analysis. A lot of people say that's where your differences might be in, in lipid content or fatty acid profile. Uh, all the new studies we've completed in our incubator We've done a, a constant temp and also a, a diurnal temp to see if that has any effect. I also don't have the, the lipid data on that yet. Hopefully, that's why I had mentioned maybe presenting later, but uh, hopefully soon we'll have all that. We'll be able to, to maximize the uh, MP ratio both at a, a constant temperature, but also in a more uh, outdoor experience where you have a, a high and a low. I mean, we'll typically even right now, we'll, we'll get to about 32 in the afternoon and drop off to about 25 to 27 uh, at night. So we're trying to see if that uh, difference in, in, in temperature day, day to night cycle has an effect on optimizing the MP ratio. Again, in this case, uh, they were all really close, but statistically, uh, the 16 to 1 uh, performed as well as the 2.25 to 1. Uh, and the 9.125 uh, significantly more final biomass than the 16 to 1, 
but uh, considering the difference in the amount of phosphorus, uh, I would imagine from an economic standpoint, you'd still, uh, you wouldn't see much of a difference, considering the small difference in growth. And then, just like to thank all the people who have worked on this, we have numerous people, uh, John, Marcy, Zach, Nathan, Aaron, uh, Will, Christina, Dr. Samoka, Marcy, Jesse, David, uh, Stafford, Dr. Zimba, and the funding for this has come from the Texas AgriLife Research Bioenergy Initiatives Program, NAB Program, Texas A&M AgriLife Research, uh, the DOE Grant, and uh, Texas A&M University Corpus Christi uh, has helped with some of the analysis. Any questions? Right. He's asking how we define uh, nitrogen limited, uh, limitation conditions. For this, actually, because we do the nutrients every day, uh, we actually determine when it's not detected by the detector, which is about 0.2 milligrams per liter, that's where we'll say we have nitrogen limitation. So it's not, I know there's a lot of people out there that talk about even before you reach that point, the cells don't have the ability to, to pull the nutrient. There has to be a higher concentration to pull it into the cell. But just to be fair in terms of, because we're using mixed species and it's outdoors, we'll wait until we get a, a not detected on the, the field lab. And, and you measure the, uh, you measure the, we, we, we filter. We measure the solution once a day, and that's for ammonia and then nitrate, nitrate, and we do it as N. So it's ammonia, nitrate, and nitrate, nitrate. So we look at the total N, and when it's not detected. Yeah, the, 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 Dr. Fernandez asked, when do we consider the culture to be nitrogen limited? Uh, do, do you have a wrong user in PPM or what, Anthony? Well, I, I, I mentioned that when it's uh, the instrument that analyzes it, uh, reads in ppm, milligrams per liter, uh, we can read down to about 0.2. Anything under that, uh, we count as not detected. You show that you do have a fluctuation of the season. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, we should follow that. So the it is a peak. What about protein? Do you have any fluctuation of protein? We haven't looked. We don't have the protein. What do you think is uh, say for example, when you're not producing oil and the uh, food, you it, think you you getting uh, uh, maybe more protein? protein? It, it should be higher in protein. Yeah. It should be higher. And what we're doing now, uh, the studies we have out, uh, even for the Struvite studies, we're collecting a larger sample size. We're just spinning more down uh, in hopes of uh, of sending some of them off for protein analysis, just to see where we where we stand. And then the other key would be some of the new species that we're identifying uh, in time. We have to send those off just to see what the the profiles are to see if, if we can eventually get to the point where you can actually mix or blend based not only on biomass growth but also an amino acid or a fatty acid composition. And that may be more difficult to do outdoors because you're constantly having changes in the profile, but it might be something that you could do more easily indoors where you have a, a constant uh, defined conditions. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Landovar asked if we knew what the protein content was of the, uh, of the biomass. And what was your answer? Uh, we, we haven't looked at protein content. Uh, but I yeah, we speculate that it would be higher, but we haven't analyzed the samples for specifically for protein. Dr. Landover asked, "What uh, is a possible reason why certain species do better together and certain ones don't?" If you go through a lot of the literature from the ecological standpoint, a lot of people look at. Uh, Different algae have different uh, light absorption capabilities, uh, different wavelength, and a lot of people speculate if you pick a nice mixture, so there's no competition for, for light, whereas perhaps with the uh, two nanos, they're both nano, uh, they probably have the exact same uh, light absorption capability, they probably have the exact same nutrient requirements, so they're actually competing with each other. Whereas you have the phaeodactylum, you have the nano, 
maybe you're getting, uh, you're just more complementary in terms of the light absorption and the, uh, the nutrients. And there, there are people who have done studies uh, looking at the, the absorption uh, spectra for the algae and to try to, to mix them. Right now, again, because we're focused on local species, the best we can do is we're not selecting a specific genus. We're just going like M4. We know it's M4, but we don't know exactly what M4. So it's hard to look up them in the literature and see the exact uh, the profile on it, just because we're focused on trying to start somewhere with a, a local species. Anthony, if you start with a pure culture in the raceway, how long can you maintain that culture with a purity that would be considered commercial? Uh, it's going to really depend on uh, most of the studies we've done. We've kept them out there uh, 15, 16 days. Uh, you know, there's still the ones that start monoculture are still monoculture. There are ciliates in there. There's some bacteria in there. Uh, but it, it really depends on how pure you would need it. I, I would say in most cases you're still looking at something maybe 95% uh, of the microalgae you started with, maybe 5% something else. I mean, we, it's hard to really get a, a grasp of uh, how much bacteria is in there. I mean, we see the cells, but we don't. Uh, we don't do a, a bacterial cell count. Thank you. Right. One more question. We, uh, now we're trying to summarize uh, your uh, time course of production. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, have you done uh, a summary of how much you, the uh, rest estimation, how much uh, oil you can put to use annually uh, in monoculture versus uh, mixed culture? Dr. Leonard, we're asking for uh, percentage-wise in terms of uh, oil capacity. Uh, we had looked at the one estimation. Uh, in this case, the uh, because you have higher growth in the mixed cultures, or at least similar growth, you'd get higher lipid productivity. Because in, in no cases did the mixed culture do significantly worse than a monoculture. You either broke even or it was higher. And also in terms of lipid productivity, you never had the mixed culture with a lower total lipid content than a, a monoculture. So in this case, yeah, the, the mixed culture would give you the overall higher yearly biomass and, the, and therefore the higher uh, uh, lipid uh, content. You see, that you are accumulating that benefit by every month. So at the end of the year, you what, 20%, 30%? I, I remember we we I had that role. I don't remember it offhand what it was, but it's the the big key I still think is to show that this can be done not just ten to fourteen or sixteen days at a time and then jump three months out, but what can you do uh, long term? And even now this summer, uh, hitting thirty five or thirty six, if we just had Feo and and, and nano in that raceway, our productivity for the summer would have been really low. It, it seems to me that, uh, that if you uh, get a, a, a more of the range of plant material, you know, just judge by the show here, mm -hmm. uh, and then you get uh, quality protein by having more diversity of uh, amino acids uh, in the wind or the feed side. But yeah. I think I just want to start uh, looking at that. Uh, with the diversity of uh, amino acids, uh, mm -hmm. and then complement uh, you know, the efficiency of one or another for people like to do when you can, yeah. Oil and, you know, seeds, uh, so Dr. Landover asked about uh, we have better, pretty much we have better lipid production during certain seasons, uh, perhaps better protein production during others, and typically you can win in both seasons, maybe. Two seasons you produce for oil, for uh, biofuel, and two seasons you produce uh, for a better amino acid or, or, or animal or terrestrial feed. If, uh, if you take a sample of that algae uh, after your 14 days and you have it in a jar or a column or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just sort of all, does the algae more layers 
squad where they have you with the hire with it, like close to the top or anything? Or does it stratify all the people who stay home with the people? Uh, the question was, if I was to take a sample out and just let it sit, would the algae uh, stratify? Uh, typically, even if we take algae out, we're always mixing it or, or bubbling it. I've never let it. The only time we really let it sit is if, uh, if we get a little bit of a contamination, you can cut the air off to it. Uh, and typically, uh, the contamination will suffer faster from the lack of oxygen than the algae. So you can actually clean up a culture a little bit that way. But I've never looked at whether it, it stratifies. So it's not like the, the algae with the higher lipid that floats to the top and you can skim it off like the heart is like taking cream off the milk. I, I, don't, it's not that simple. I don't believe it's that simple. I mean, we, we haven't. The only one I know, the Amphora we were talking about, uh, if you shut the uh, paddle wheels off or you shut the air off, it, it settles uh, fairly fast. Even the one we just used this summer that was less clumpy than the ones in the past, it will still settle out of solution fairly fast. And, and like in a centrifuge or something, you can't separate the high limits and the low limits. I mean, we, we run just to remove everything. I mean, it may be possible, but I haven't seen uh, anyone doing that to actually pick and choose what you want. Your long-term goal when you do so to continue production, you would, you would somehow have a continued farm as well, right? That's correct, yeah. So what we've actually set up now, uh, we're pretty much limited by uh, raceways, but we we got a little uh, centrifuge uh, that actually can run pretty much 24-7 if we had to, and we're plumbing it in. And then the goal would be when you hit when you run out of nutrients, so you get all the nutrients in the biomass, you cut the level down and then fill it back up with seawater and just keep continually harvesting. And, and that's, you know, always the big goal. And then as you continually harvest, will you see these changes in a, a species? Say you put three or four species, will they constantly keep changing to keep your biomass production constant? And then that, you know, what will the level of contamination be over time?